on today's uh, webinar, I'll be focusing on free to use software uh, and, and some of the risk associated with that. Uh, you know, joining the discussion today will be Lee Kennedy, uh, our service manager at Abacus Technologies. So uh, glad having him as part of my, my team on these webinars to talk through these topics uh, that we have. We're trying to do these twice a month. So uh, please look uh, and follow us on social media for uh, webinars that we will be having uh, or hosting in the future. Uh, this will be recorded so you can catch it uh, after the fact on YouTube. Uh, if you in our YouTube channel, if you'd like to, so we'll go and get started. A uh, very important topic today, especially uh, I think in the uh, situation we're facing with the pandemic, as uh, a lot of uh, users went home to work, they started adopting different types of software uh, to facilitate their business, and, and obviously being cost conscious in some of those decisions, uh, they turn themselves to often software that's free. And there is some real good free software out there to use. There's also some software, but it also can bring some risks uh, to your uh, your business as well. Uh, just looking at the agenda today, or first of all, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box if you're live with us. So uh, we'll try to answer those throughout the webinar. I'm not going to wait till the very end to do the q and I'll uh, like to try to address those as soon as they come up. So you should see a little question uh, Q&A box to click on in Zoom. So if you just click on that, you can type it in there and uh, Lee and I will try to get an answer for it as soon as we see it. Um, agenda today. So we're going to talk a little bit, uh, a couple of things. One, about the different types of free software out there. There are a lot of different categories, different types of uh, software, and they do a lot of different things. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the experiences Lee and I have had with those software, some good, some bad. Uh, and then uh, some things you could you should think about before downloading, uh, you know, and some considerations for your business with using free software. Uh, we're going to make some recommendations. Uh, we, we do uh, often use free software, uh, utilities, and different different types of software release so I've got a bunch of them I sort of just went out online and just threw a bunch of them up here uh, and there are a lot of them out there uh, you know what are some that you see in this list that uh, you've used and, and liked or not liked uh, you know for personal use I've used Dropbox um... Amazon Drive obviously zoom used it uh, Trello is a great tool we use in the office. Um, open Office, I've used it. Not a huge fan of it. I guess you just kind of get used to running uh, Microsoft's version. And it's 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 okay. It's uh, you know usually a few years behind what you're currently at. Uh, Evernote's a good one. Um, SpiceWorks, a lot of moving pieces to that one, but it's a good mm -hmm. tool. Uh, tree size free, you know, putty, C cleaner, all those troubles. Yeah. Tools. The, the catch is though, you know, those are all great tools. The catch is though, make sure you're actually downloading the right tool and not <laughs> yeah. hitting on one of the ads on one of those websites that are, you know, typically littered with different ads and you got the big green download button that sends you. Oh yeah. Who knows where uh, it's easy to get lost on some of those pages. Yeah, so, yeah, I, th I think I've, I've used a lot of these uh, listed. I mean, we inactively use some of them. I mean, we've got, I use Amazon Drive. I've used Dropbox before. I've used SugarSync before. Uh, you know, Slack, I've got some experience with Trello. Uh, looked at the new Google Meet, which is their Zoom competitor. Just came out. It showed up in my, uh, you know, Gmail account not long ago. Uh, I've used Zoho uh, a little bit here and there, Google Docs, Evernote. Uh, and then all those utilities are some of the ones I have. I haven't used all of them, uh, but those as well. So, you know, I think we, we've used a lot of those in our experience and through our career from a technology standpoint and have enjoyed using some of them, uh, and they definitely have their, their place. So if we look at these different categories, you know, let's talk about each one individually, but, you know, the file share and sync category. So, what do those programs do, Lee? Talk about talk a little bit about your experience with them and how you might use them, and your you know how you might use them. 
Sure. Um, you know, a lot of these I, I've used on a personal basis, not so much a work base. We've got in-house tools for that. Um, we can get into that here in a minute. But really what these tiles, do, um, these applications do is they can replicate file structures or directories off of your local machine, your personal device, and sync that out somewhere into the cloud. Uh, don't mistake in that as a backup system because yeah. if, if your file gets deleted, guess what? It gets synced and deleted on the other side or, you know, you know, it's malware. It's not a backup solution. So keep that in mind. If you are using it as a backup solution, I would strongly recommend you uh, figure something, uh, something else out. Yeah, I, I think that is that. You know, they, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll say that's a, that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions of file share and sync that it's a it's a backup solution and it's really not that. Um, it, I think primarily is used to to share files to other people you may know. Also, if you use multiple devices, uh, you can sync your files or, or information across those devices simply by logging in. So those are the two things I've used it most for. Um, I know uh, Dropbox is a standalone solution. You can, uh, they have, do have a free version. So you can sign up and uh, from their website, if you've got an email address, then you can get it. Uh, it, it you know, so you can actually start using it pretty quickly. They make that process very seamless and they give you free space with it. So you can get a couple of uh, gig or maybe even a terabyte of space there for free and, and some limited features. And that's something, something to think about with all these fire, file share and sync programs. A lot of times you get something with them you know in, in some basic set of features and some basic storage capacity but a lot of times it's not enough to actually uh you know put all your files up there maybe you don't want to put all your files up there uh but both dropbox and box offer uh you know similar free what i call free packages uh you know for you to they of course all of these programs have paid versions uh so you can definitely subscribe to those paid versions to get more storage I think the idea behind them, especially is to get you to start, hey, start storing your data out there. And we know what happens when you start uh, accumulating data in a location. It tends to grow pretty quickly uh, over time. So uh, a lot, and I've even seen some, I don't know if you've seen these, Lee, but I've seen some programs that uh, will actually combine all these. So you get one portal and you link all these other other stores, uh, you know, mediums to it. And then you can sort of manage it from one place, almost consolidate all the space into one thing. Have you ever used anything like that before? I've heard of them. I've never, I've never used them. Yeah, as I, I've seen them in practice, but I've always been a little bit scared to link everything up like that. I don't know, just not something I've been yeah. a big fan of. One of them I put up there is On Cloud. Um, On Cloud is a pretty unique. Uh, it's really a platform but it is something you can subscribe to. Uh, they do have a free version of it. You can definitely subscribe to it, but you can also deploy it on your own network internally and uh, host your own sort of file sync and share program. I've actually got a version of that running here in the house uh, that I use to store some files on to move files between computers if I need to for the kids and all. So I really liked it. I just uh, installed it a week or so ago and it's a pretty neat little, uh, Tool set. It looks a lot like ShareFile, uh, which is another one. It's not a ShareFile is not free, but uh, OnCloud is something you can download. I believe it's like a, more of an open source, but it doesn't cost anything if you want to administrate it. So, uh, I, I would say, would you say these are probably the most popular types of free software we see out there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You got. Them. Pretty yeah, I, covered all good good subjects on there. One thing I would like to add, though, is you know maybe the app space for mobile devices, whether it be mm -hmm. games or you know I can remember in the past, I don't know, it was shortly after the iPhone came out, they released a uh, flashlight uh, yeah. app for that, and it was riddled with malware. And I mean, you know, probably millions of people ended up downloading it. So yeah, you know, with those two. Yeah, the, in, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, some of the, the uh, security considerations with some of these softwares. Uh, collaboration is another category we've seen a lot of. Obviously, Zoom has a free package that you can download and start using. I think it's limited to like a 40-minute meeting, and it does have some other limitations there. Uh, what about Slack? We use Slack internally. How do you like Slack, uh, you know, Lee? I'm sorry. I'm having technical difficulties with my internet over here. 
Uh, bear, bear with me, Brian. I'm going to go hardwire in real quick. Okay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Slack. Slack is something uh, – is a collaboration tool, so it allows your team – or you can collaborate with your team um, – you know, across that platform, mobile devices, iPads, your iPhone, uh, you know, even uh, on your desktop computer. So uh, it's a it's a program we started using as a free program here in House at Abacus. And then, you know, after uh, we started using it, we really liked it. And we found that it really changed the way uh, we work, especially uh, not using emails. Microsoft Teams is another platform that I think competes directly with Slack. Um, and it has been free for some time now. If you uh, during the pandemic, they began offering Teams as a free option to uh, many out there. If you already if you're already an Office 365 subscriber, then uh, chances are you can already access that platform because it's included with most of their packages. Uh, but a lot of uh, companies moved out to Teams uh, quickly after uh, the pandemic happened, so they could make so they could keep collaborating with their. Uh, employees and keep the line of communication open. Uh, Google Meet is a relatively new player in the market uh, with, I think it probably used to be Google Hangouts, maybe not too sure about that, but um, but it is a, a competitor to Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, and also to Slack. So it has some, and it has some of the features and all, some of the features of those uh, included with it. It is free to use. So if you have a Gmail account, you can log into your Gmail account. It'll be right there uh, in the bottom left. You'll see the Google Meet option. Uh, so it is another free to use uh, option. If you just want to meet up, you could even use that personally, not so much as a business standpoint, uh, if you wanted to invite some users to that. Some others I found, just to show you how, I think to demonstrate how exactly how many types out there. I just sort of did a quick look up in Google and, you know, we have uh, two like Glip and Kesmo. And I mean, there are just a ton of these types of softwares out there uh, for collaboration. Most of them have some kind of free option or they are free, uh, you know, to, to subscribe to and you can get started on them very quickly. All you really need is an email address and to put in a password. You may have to download a client, but uh, very useful. We use Trello as well. Trello is a great uh, we really like Trello. We use it, uh, you know, internally for our EOS initiative. Uh, it's great for project tracking, and uh, I really like it to manage meetings. So take a look at that one as well. Okay, you back with us, Lee? I'm back with you. Sorry. All right, awesome. So uh, <laughs> business productivity. I think this is probably one of the biggest ones we see. Uh, one of the ones we see, like Open Office. You talked about Open Office a few minutes ago in the introduction. So tell me a little bit more about your your. I'll tell you about my experience with it, but go ahead. I'd love to hear hear more from you about it. Well, Open Office, you know, it it works, but you have to understand the holdbacks. You know, you got to know to not save the file type as a default Open Office file type because most likely ninety percent of the people you're exchanging files with. Um, are not on the open office platform. They're actually on the, mm -hmm. the Microsoft uh, office platform. So a lot of the times you'll see people that really don't know what they're doing, exchanging files. You know, somebody that's running office doesn't know how to open that file type or can't open it. You have to go back and forth. Um, that was always a pain. And it, it's not, it's not that stable. It's not supported by anything. It's, it's open office. You know, it's literally just a free version that somebody or a group of people are out there writing and you know trying to include the features that are that are out there now but like i mentioned they're usually a couple of years behind about where microsoft is now yeah we have seen and zoho has an zoho google docs and open office are all three i would say business productivity platforms that complete directly with microsoft office so uh those started uh coming out uh, i think in the 2005 to 2008 time frame as an online version of Excel and Office because, you know, people didn't want to go out and spend, uh, you know, hundreds of dollars to purchase the Office suite. Uh, that was before Office was a subscription. So a lot of these companies took things online. Open Office being the exception there, but Open Office was a, a free to install program. Uh, but it, you know, just like any free program, it, it, it's free. So there are some things that come with that. Uh, obviously, compatibility across other other paid platforms is something you always need to consider. Uh, you know, sometimes it may uh, meet your needs, but if you ever want to to move it or translate it across another platform, then you may have some compatibility issues there. 
so we still have some clients that use open office and have seen that uh, proliferate, you know, in many different areas. And, uh, you know, Zoho and Google are still out there. Um, I like Google Docs is pretty neat. I use it personally sometimes to do some things, uh, not a whole lot, but uh, I do find it uh, quite a neat little tool to use, uh, you know, because it's linked to my Gmail account. Uh, Basecamp is another productivity sort of collaboration. Airtable is one of the new ones out there, more project management type stuff. Um, you know, Evernote's another great place, almost like a competitor to Microsoft OneNote. Uh, this in the office uh, suite. Um, it does have a free version. You can all of these have some type of free version associated with them. So all you have to do is either register an email or, or uh, you know, start a username and get started. Now here's I'm gonna throw a big one out there. What about the Linux? I sort of put Linux in here as an operating system. What about the Linux operating system? You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, Linux operating system is great operating system. Uh, it's from a cyber standpoint, I'm going to say it's not targeted, but it's not nearly as targeted as, you know, big, big names like Microsoft or big money makers like Microsoft and stuff like that. But uh, I think Linux operating systems are, are a, a great option. The only problem is going to be, you know, if this is on a, a corporate machine, are you going to incorporate yeah. in your corporation? Uh, that might be a challenge without uh, a lot of resources. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I uh, I think Linux is a great operating system to use if you've got just a computer to kick around the house. Maybe it's an older laptop. You don't want to pay for a Windows license. Maybe it didn't come with Windows. Maybe it had an older version of Windows on it. Uh, a lot of times you can uh, you know put Ubuntu on it or another version of Linux, and that will allow you to at least use a laptop. If, if for anything else, uh, just browsing the internet and doing some basic uh, you know basic productivity actions on it so uh, you know there's a lot of different versions of Linux are out there there are open source software so uh, it's free to download easy to install uh, and you know, I think and it takes a lot less resources than say your Windows machine I would say the one thing you want to make sure if you ever want to look at a Linux box is uh, just make sure you get the one at least for me I like the, the user the graphical user interface if you're not careful you'll download the command line on the only version uh, I'm not so good with Linux command line, so that could be a problem. <laughs> I, I'm used to the Windows graphical version. Uh, I do agree about the business side of it, uh, that we don't see a lot of Linux machines and businesses, and I think uh, you know there's obviously some shortcomings with an operating system for use in a, in a Windows domain environment. Yeah. And, and then our final uh, category is utilities. Uh, you know, we, I think as IT guys, we have a lot of utilities out there we probably use that are free to download. Which one of these do you like, Lee? Well, I'm, I'm kind of an old school guy. You can't go wrong with Putty. Uh, love some Putty. Telnet SSH tool. Um, you know, there's several FTP ones that aren't on here. Trees, you mm -hmm. know, uh, tree size free is a popular one. Uh, you know, I'm a old X spice works guy for ticketing system and stuff like that. Like yeah, it was good. There were, you know, there's a movie, there's some moving parts with that one, but a, a great open source tool to you to utilize. Yeah. One I put on there and this, this is going to probably jog your memory. Do you remember the one that you installed on windows XP called tweak UI? Do you remember that one? Ah, I don't recall that one. <laughs> well, it was a little free piece of software and it allowed you to tweak the user interface of windows XP uh, to add like multiple desktops and you could have the clear text. I mean, it had some really cool okay. features in there that was, it, but it was a totally free download, totally tweaked the operating system, uh, I <laughs> guess, and, and uncovered some like areas that you normally didn't have access to. But uh, that was a, a long, that was like I said, a, a while back, but it was a free piece of software and all these up here uh, are free. I mean, we use InMap a lot in our cyber work, but if you want to scan a network to look at networks, uh, you know, network components or devices, that's a great one. Uh, you know, I use Putty a lot too for SSH, uh, you know, and, uh, and other connectivity or other connections to different places. And, you know, I think the, the IT guys, you know, if you're an internal IT person, there, there are a lot of different tools out there you probably use that are free uh, that are really easy to download and to deploy. Uh, and I think of, I probably have several of my, even on my computer now that I use. So, well, with, so with that being said, also, you know, if you're not in IT or internal IT, don't go installing all these on your corporate machine, get them <laughs> yeah. approved, make sure that they're approved or, you know, just some of them, if you don't know what you're doing and going out and grabbing these, they, it could be dangerous. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a great uh, segue into our next slide is think before you click or download. So, <laughs> yeah. so we talked about there's several different categories out there, but let's sort of talk about the consider what you need to consider. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of businesses out there right now. You know, they're trying to save money. Uh, they have remote workers that you know may not you know so they may have lost control of those machines a little bit because they're outside the corporate environment. Uh, you know we're all looking for different ways and new ways to conduct business. So a lot of people are turning to that free software, you know, try to find you know what uh, they may want to use uh, to help their business. So let's talk about that. So security considerations. I've got some listed up there, but. Uh, yeah. What do you think about those? I think the biggest one there is if you go try to find a piece of software and it's off of a, a site mirror or something like that, some of those sites are so cluttered. You can be like, oh, go download this tool, click here, you click here, and it takes you to a page. And the download's there, but it is so hard to find with all the jazz and ads. And, you know, they look legit. It might even be the file name you're looking for, but if you hover over it, you'll notice that you're not, that's not the right file. Uh, and I'm not saying that the software that, you're trying to download isn't there, but then sometimes, you know, you have to have a trained eye to find it. And sometimes I struggle finding the right thing to download in some of those pages. Yeah, I agree. When you uh, go to something like sourceforge.net or download.com, right. you know, these yeah. sites that'll host the downloads from these free softwares, uh, sometimes you really don't know what you're getting to. There's so many advertising banners and really that's just opportunities uh, for you to download some a program you're not really looking for, uh, particular if it could be adware, malware, virus, or something hosted on the sites. Uh, so you really have to be careful in just getting to the software to download it because right. uh, just doing that can bring about some risk within its own. Yeah, and if you don't know what you're doing, avoid those sites. You know, if you yeah. want to go, if you want to go, you know, download C Cleaner, you can go to cncleaner.org or whatever it might it might be. Uh, and, yeah. and get it, but once you know, once you get redirected off to one of these sites, be extremely careful. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, if you can go directly to the site, uh, I know I like Seven Zip. I didn't list that one, but it's another compression yeah, software. Absolutely. But you can type in Seven Zip in Google, and there it'll send up four or five sites that you can download, and they're not all the same. You need to go to sevenzip.org, which is the actual site to download it. So. Uh, so be, I think just getting to these software programs and downloading, you got to be really careful about, uh, because you may not end up at a legit site and it can definitely have, uh, open you up to some risks downloading something you didn't want to download. Um, what about programming? Now, I think a lot of times these programs are made for function, not security. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they're made to get one job done and that's it typically, you know, uh, not a whole lot of, uh, uh, extras or extras being security and well thought out uh, um, planning around that. So, yeah, and I think that leads into there could be a lot of vulnerabilities associated with it. So, you know, just because it's free, uh, you know, and it maybe the site looks legitimate, maybe they have a, a good development staff, it doesn't mean that their software doesn't have some type of uh, vulnerability embedded into it. And that may not be as keen to uh you know fixing those vulnerabilities is some other paid software that we've seen out there and even uh if we look back at what happened uh you know with zoom in the media uh just a few months ago when people started jumping on the zoom bandwagon you know zoom you know it started getting a lot of scrutiny and it found out hey there's some pretty serious vulnerabilities there at the beginning uh, when it came to sharing files in the chat window and different different operations so it just wasn't on zoom's radar to be programming that stuff uh, those functions with security in mind and uh, those vulnerabilities did get exploited and they had to uh, come to the table and they did fix a lot of them. They've done a great job with, with fixing those. But uh, but these vulnerabilities may exist in other types of free software that we use. So we need to be very careful about, uh, you know, the reputation of the software. Uh, and also if you run vulnerability scans, it could show up on that as well. Um, what about those advertising banners? Don't you hate when you download something that's free and then, hey, there's an ad that pops up in it? Yeah, it's been a while, you know, since I've done that or like a toolbar pull pop up in your browser. It's been a while since I've seen one of those. I think I don't think they've gone away. I still see them every once in a while, but uh, man, those are the worst. Well, I remember a while back you used to download Java Runtime uh, because you had to have it to run some applications. All of a sudden you find yourself installing McAfee or something, some program you never, and if you don't uncheck that box, it will install it for you. And, and uh, you know, that that may not be a, a, a legit advertising banner, but sometimes we, 
we'll see, you know, sort of tag along programs uh, with these uh, free software. Well, you know, look at look at Google Chrome. I think they tr- still try to download Adobe or McAfee or yeah. You know, they try to do that all the time and sneak that past you. Yeah, and we didn't really talk about extensions for browsers, but that that is another thing to think about. There's a lot of extensions out there that exist for the different browsers, and they can be just as bad as the the programs that you download. So we talk about business considerations. Uh, you know, I think this is probably one of the the non technical areas of free to use software. Uh, you know, I, I think sometimes it's been a big win for business processes. I think back when, hey, we we started uh, we use EOS here at Abacus and we started implementing the processes and and uh, you know tasks associated with that. And one of the biggest challenges we had was trying to manage that process in our meetings. And uh, we turned to Trello, which is a, a free use software. Uh, I felt like it was a big win for us. Helped us, you know, really facilitate those meetings. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. They've been a big help. Uh, there's a lot of other tools, you know, we probably still need to, to look up and utilize. But uh, that was a that was a big win for us. Um, and uh, it does have some free options. Uh, I mean, free it, it is free to use software. I highly recommend that one. Uh, it does have some paid options. Uh, you know, we haven't found a reason to pay for it yet. So the free has been a better option for us. Uh, sometimes you'll find that, uh, you know, the options you pay for, uh, may not add features and functionality that you really need. So be careful if you do move from a free to paid option. Know what you're getting. A lot of times it, it is like, you know, hey, you don't, not necessarily more features, but it may be more space. It may be, uh, you know, a little bit more robust platform or access to more best fun. That's where Slack gets you. If you remember back, we started using Slack. Yep. Uh, you know, he'll say, hey, well, you, we're only going to let you store so much history. Uh, you know, in your Slack, in your Slack feeds, and I'm like, oh wow, well, that's a limitation. We don't, we're, we're using it, we like it, so we, we of course, upped up and paid for it. Uh, but it also gives you an idea of, you know, what you're, you know, if you're going to use it and if you can use it. Uh, you know, one thing I thought about too to consider is because these programs are free. You know, you may have employees that maybe using them or groups of employees, maybe groups, uh, without any authorization. Any thoughts on that, Lee? Uh, you know, like I mentioned before, get it approved. You know, the, here's the biggest thing that scares me and me and the team, and we've all discussed this at Abacus on how we can uh, control it outside of just it being corporate policies. And I'm not talking on uh, policies for Abacus for all, all the companies we work with. Um, the file syncing one, you know, that you mentioned earlier, how do you prevent users from putting their personal Dropbox or, you know, putting corporate files in their personal Dropbox and syncing it, all of a sudden you've got a big, you know, data loss prevention issue. Yeah. Where there could be sensitive, sensitive information spread across, you know, somebody's four or five, you know, per, personal devices. Uh, and we don't really have a solution for that other than, you know, a policy saying you do not install this software without being approved, but it, it is a concern. Yeah, I'd say that's one of the biggest uh, risks you have with these types of software is employees can, it's easy for them to download it. It's easy, relatively easy for them to install it as well and begin just using it on, on, a, on their personal basis. Maybe they did install it at home. They say, hey, I could really use this at work. But it may, be not, it may not be a software that's sanctioned for corporate use and for many reasons. Uh, but I don't know how many times we we've logged on to a you know help with a client machine and there's a guy they got Dropbox they got Sugar Sync they got you know hey well, this is my personal this is business I just download this for the fun of it uh, you know and then you, you sort of look at the the overall leadership of the company and they're like oh we don't use any of this stuff or they're not supposed to be using it so I think that's something you have to look at and that's one of the many business considerations you have to have. Uh, with the free use software is, hey, you could have some employees using this without authorization. And that brings up the next point, which you talked about, the lack of control over data. Uh, you know, there there are definitely instances where employees could take the data that they have, this your corporate data, and put it in these platforms. And you, at that point, have lost control over it uh, because you don't, in, you don't control the authentication of it. You may not control the movement of it, the transmission of it. Uh, and then, uh, and it could be tied to that, uh, you know, employee's personal email account, which you may not be to have access to if they leave the company. 
So this uh, this type of software, I mean, you know, it's free, it's easy to get to. Uh, you know, it can definitely bring about many types of risks. You know, across uh, the corporate environment for leaders to take in take in account to. Uh, next, say maintenance and updates. Uh, you know, no doubt a lot of this free software does not include support. Uh, a lot of times documentation may not be available for it. So that is something to think about there um, as well. Uh, that uh, a lot, especially if it's some type of, I would say, off the shelf, it may be free. Uh, but uh, a lot of times you, with the free version, there's no support included. So you can call a day and they won't, they will not be there for you or you, they won't be answering your questions. Uh, you ever seen a software where the developer just loses interest and quits developing it? I've seen that all around the board. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel bad for, you know, not the open, you know, the open source systems or the free software. Not that, you know, that's kind of expected. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hate to run across a company where they've invested a lot of money on a line mm -hmm. of business software application and they have a problem with it and they ask you to go and look into it. And then all of a sudden, the only way you can fix it is to involve a developer to fix it because the existing one or the people that supported or built it, like you said, lost interest or yep. closed closed doors or you know, and all of a sudden you, it becomes a contact. Of the, you know, we got to call so and so that one guy. Then, you know, then you know when you hear that you're like, oh no, this is not going to. Well, you know, I think, what was it? You know, you also have to think a lot of times they don't develop these, keep developing the softwares, especially if they have to uh, redevelop them for newer operating systems. You know, Very say true. when you move from Windows XP to Windows 7 to Windows 10, you know, Microsoft changes a lot behind the scenes as far as their code base. And these, these packages have to be kept up to date. Uh, I think, what was the encryption software I use with it? TrueCrypt? TrueCrypt, yep. TrueCrypt, that's worked a great. On, yeah. Worked on Windows Seven, but not Windows Eight. Yeah, that was one that uh, you know a lot of people liked. TrueCrypt, it was an easy to use, free deployment uh, to encrypt your drive because uh, drive encryption is not cheap, uh, and sometimes it doesn't work well. But this is a, this is a free use software, and it worked really well. It was very accessible. And uh, what do you know when when Microsoft moved from Windows Seven to Windows Eight and Ten platform? And they they didn't care it any further than that. So we had a lot of a lot of client. We actually had a couple of clients and people asking about it. Uh, you know, some people sort of like panicking now. They have to find a new solution because the free solution they went once had uh, quit working. So there are some risks to uh, using the free solutions, and, and especially if the support, development, all that uh, that sort of underpinning of what keeps that software going uh, is lost. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about hosted data. You know, if you, you put your data in Google Docs or or uh, Dropbox, box, it's all it's all in a cloud somewhere. You know, what if they're not taking care of it? You know, what about some of these other free software? What about your data? I would definitely like you know the big names like Google and um, Dropbox, Amazon, and stuff like that. That's free. I would look into because i don't know i would have to i don't use i don't use um anymore i don't use dropbox or um, amazon but man i would really want to dig into what they're doing to protect my data and then maybe even ask myself what could i do more to better pr protect my data that's sitting out there is there anything else i can do um, outside of their realm whether it be built in mfa or something like that yeah, I think the security features have to be top of mind when you're looking at any of these platforms, especially the free ones. You know, what, what options do they provide you to secure your data? Is it encrypted when it's stored on their servers? Do you have an MFA option for authentication? Um, but also, you know, what happens, what happens to your data if they have a problem? Uh, does Is it kept, is it, you know, do they have a backup of your data? What is their policy around that? So those are all some things. Hey, this is this is free software. It's great to use. It has some great features. But, uh, you know, what if something happens? What if something goes wrong? What happens to your data? And also you got to think about if you try to exit that software, how do you make sure that your data is out of there? You know, look at their policy around that because that's extremely important. You know, finally we talk about uh, freemium versus paid. Um, you know, and I know there's some packages we started out uh, with freemium. You know, basically you get a, a free version of the software with probably some limitations. 
Uh, hey, I think the freemium software is pretty good. It, it, for certain projects and services, uh, it could be a good option for you. Um, yeah, I think, I think if you just consider the fact that it's free and I mean, don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially to a free program like that, uh, you know, take advantage of them, but don't, don't, you know, don't dedicate your line of business workflow to, to a free application, you know? Yeah, there, there's definitely some dangers in the sort of going all in on a free platform, uh, you know, for some of the risk we, we've mentioned, but, but also just from a, a business risk of, uh, you know, I've seen individuals, I mean, I've seen companies and individuals just put everything they have into this free project and free software and ends up being the, the main say of their business. Then all of a sudden it goes away <laughs> for right. some reason or another, or, or maybe they slap some limitations on it that makes it not so great as a free product anymore. So uh, I, I think I, it's, I've seen stuff go from free to not free all of a sudden. And yeah, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to pay the piper or, you know, you're going to be able to walk away from it. No, no harm, no foul. So. Yeah. yeah. And it does change and they will change the, the way those, uh, the software work occasionally. And, you know, someone could come in and get new ownership, of the company and said, Hey, this is no longer be free. Everybody's got to pay for it. Uh, definitely seen that happen. Uh, but sometimes free is all you need. So I think you have to make a good business decision about what you're trying to do uh, with the software. You know, is is uh, is the free option going to be workable for you? And make sure you take into account all these risks uh, with it. Uh, I think the other thing, if it's, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So be very careful about uh, the offerings uh, that are out there. Uh, some do come with strings attached to them. Uh, could be uh, you having ads uh, on your screen and you don't just remember you don't get control of those banners or those ads that come across your screen uh, whoever owns that software and whoever's paid for that space uh, you know gets to uh, own that so you'd hate to be sharing your screen out in the zoom meeting uh, with a nice ad that comes up to you that could embarrass you along the way so and if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're entertaining the idea do do your homework take the time to read the reviews look them up make sure they're reputable before you just blindly go installing it take just, yeah. yeah that'd be my biggest takeaway from this thing just take your time i think it was yeah. uh you know right there at the head click before you download you know, do oh, yeah. your research just make sure uh make sure you know what you're getting into yeah yeah, if, if you can look at some reviews, talk to some people that may uh, use it. Hey, hey, call uh, you know, call your IT provider. You can call yeah. us. We'll be happy to talk to you through it and see if we have any experience with it before uh, you go all in and download it. And I think the last thing we'll close with this, but terms and conditions. Uh, you know, make sure you read the fine print. Uh, you really, like you mentioned with that flashlight app. Uh, you know, there are a lot of software packages out there that uh, you know you really don't know what kind of data they're they're exfilling from your machine or from anything else that you use. Uh, you know, there's all, there's a lot of this free software and, and uh, free software and tools out there. You get to sign in with your Google, you can sign in with your Facebook. And just remember, as soon as you do that, then you're giving them access via an API to their data. So think very carefully about, uh, you know, when you sign up for some of these free softwares, uh, there's something in it for somebody down the road. Uh, and just be mindful of what that might be. Um, it could be your personal data. It could be some kind of uh, tracking of information that you do, browsing information or, or, or network traffic or internet traffic. So be very careful about when you, if you do use these free products that you're uh, very deliberate about, you know, the login and how you log into it and the conditions and terms that you agree to uh, before putting it on your machine. So, um, Let's wrap it up with that. What are some of your favorite ones? What is some of the free, favorite free software you've you've uh, encountered you really like? Oh man, I don't know. Uh, can't remember the name of what's the screen snapping tool? Greenwise. Green Greenshot or Greenwise? Greenshot, that's it. Greenshot's a good one. Yeah, I like that yeah. one. Um, I'm trying to think, man. I think you know. I don't really download a whole bunch of freeware you know i know slack has been great it was great yep. when we first downloaded it uh cut down on our corporate email i want to say in half it probably wasn't that much but it was a good bit yeah internal email that is well i think back over history adobe reader has been a, was a big one because not everyone can yeah. 
you know, I think that was a great free one to download, although it does have some vulnerabilities at the time. We used to use uh, Cute PDF. Do you remember that one? Oh, man. Cute PDF, absolutely. <laughs> that was an amazing little PDF printer to help you convert files to PDF. That I was, still uh, use that one. Still use that one. Yeah. Uh, that was a free one that was out there. Uh, I, I like got, a, I got tired of Adobe and their updates and issues and stuff like that. I just use Edge now. Just open them all in Edge. Yeah. So yeah, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff has come come forward where now you don't have to have it. It's free. They've added those features as free items. Yeah. Um, I use Eraser a lot. That's a good one. Uh, if you have some files you're trying to destroy in your machine to make sure nothing's there, that's a a great yeah. one to use. Uh, I think utilities. Well, I think we used Wireshark before. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I, Angry IP is another great one if you're an IT person to to pull across and look at. So I like I like Advanced IP better. Oh, just I haven't be, used that one. Just because you don't have to install it, you can simply just run the oh. VXC and it never shows up on the machine as an installed I, program. I like that. I mean, yeah. I have to check. I have to check that one out. Yeah, but I there's a, there's a lot of them out there that I think uh, you know we've used or we like to use that that have really helped us out. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, just look at, at some of the things we've talked about today. You know, look at some of the, the all kinds of. There's a lot of these tools out there. You know, they there are some considerations you need to think about for your business uh, security and also go forward considerations where if you decide to adopt that software. You know, does does paying for it make sense to you? Can you stay on the free version? You know, and also maintenance and updates for that software going forward. So, um, I think one question I had, or one question that came through, was, uh, you know, what to look for in free software. What do you need? To, what are some things you look for to make sure it's legitimate? What do you think, Lee? You got any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it goes right back to what I said. Do your research. Make sure it's a reputable company. Make sure it's a known product. Make sure you're downloading it from the correct site. Yep. Um, all of all of the above there, uh, I think, are things to take away from that. And don't be yeah. like Brian said. Don't hesitate to call us or you know your IT friends or something and, and run it past them. Just just to ask them. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I like to get personal references on software. I like to yeah. talk to someone who's actually used it. Maybe they've installed it. Uh, maybe they've adopted it to sort of get their their experience with it, because uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, hey, it looks good on the surface, but then when you get it installed, it's not what you wanted. <laughs> and I, I like to look at YouTube as well. You can check on YouTube and look at videos that people may use it or install it. Uh, that's always a good place to look as well. That way, you can sort of see it in action, and that's really what I think. My big thinking was, hey, try to find a way you can see it in action without installing it on a machine. Uh, unless you've got some kind of virtual machine or sandbox, maybe you can install it on yeah. that just to get an idea of what it's like before you wreck your machine by putting something, you know, uh, and, and that you, there, you don't want on there. Right. Yeah. And, and in the inst installation process, you know, uncheck any fluff that might come with it that you don't need. Yeah. Got to watch uh, that. If it installs automatically, you know, just turn around and go back behind it and uninstall what you don't need. Yeah, because you could end up with some malware. There's no doubt. I remember there were some of these search bars out there that, uh, hey, if you search for certain things, you get you know a benefit off of it. And, uh, well, and I, don't, it, I don't know. If you uh, do I don't not know. recommend those. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know when the last time you installed the HP printer via you know the, the full XP yeah. or the full suite. Holy smokes, it's a lot of garbage. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, bloatware out there too as well. So, well, I appreciate those who've attended this. Uh, we'll we will have this up on uh, on uh, our YouTube channel uh, very soon.